Hello, my name is Brian Gray. I direct the Foundation Program in Anthroposophy at Rudolf Center College. In this session, we're going to look at what Rudolf Center called the six essential exercises or the six basic exercises. And these are exercises that a human being freely takes up if they want to develop themselves. He said of these exercises, he called them basic or essential because he said whatever, whatever spiritual practice we're doing, we need to back it up with these particular, these six activities, because these six activities will complete the forming of the heart chakra, which is a 12 petaled organ in the astral body in the region of the heart. So there are, Brita Center describes in How to Know Higher Worlds that there are that there are these various organs, these various lotus flowers, these organs of perception, but the heart chakra has 12 petals, and six of the petals of the heart chakra are formed, and six of them are latent, six of them in a certain sense are unformed, and they need to be formed by the free human being. So by, by doing these six particular exercises, we are completing the forming of the 12 petal lotus, and when we bring the, these six exercises to fulfillment, we complete the forming of that organ, and then we begin to be able to use the heart chakra as an organ of perception and as, and as an organ of love. So the six exercises are these. Rudolf Steiner gave them a particular order. He said, when the, we need to be able to gain objectivity in our thinking. That means that in our thinking, we need to be able to take a simple object, a very simple object, and he says, for example, to gain control of our thinking, he said, don't take anything esoteric. In fact, don't even take a natural object. Rather, take something that a human being has formed, a simple object, a paper clip, a button, a, a pen, a pencil. Take a very simple object and for five minutes, hold the object in your hands, concentrate your attention on that object, and only think about the object uh, itself. Don't, don't add in, don't spin off into other other activities, but rather guide your thinking, control your thinking, so that you're thinking for five minutes a day about that object. And he said, you can use the same object for, you can change the objects every day if you wish. You can use the same object for several days. But the most important thing is not so much what you're thinking, but that you are thinking thoughts about the object that you're beholding. And this way, we begin to be objective. And he says, for example, if you're focusing on a pencil, Word, what, uh, what is a pencil? Who first, first formed a pencil? How is a pencil assembled? Where does the materials for the pencil come from? How is a graphite? How does a graphite put into the center of the pencil? What, where is the wood? What kind of wood is it? And so if we think only about the details of the forming of the pencil, the function of the pencil, the, the form and the function of the pencil, how it came to be, how many hands have touched it, what pencils are used for, and so forth, our thinking is much more directed toward a sequence of thoughts which we are then in control of. If we're thinking about a pencil and all of a sudden we begin to think about making a list of what we need to do shopping and all of a sudden we're, we've left the pencil and we're thinking about all the shopping list, then we need to bring our thinking back to the object itself and begin to think about it more, more clearly. So he said for five minutes a day, if we will exercise the control of thinking and concentrate our thinking on an object, we will gain objectivity and clarity. He says this will give strength to the soul after we birth the higher self. It will also give us much more control and much more practice, much more ability to be functional in the, in the world of the senses. The second activity, is, as he said, for every day, is to control the expression, to control our will. And he said the best way to do this is to give yourself a command when you wake up in the morning. Say, today at 1230, I'm going to take my ring and I'm going to turn it 360 degrees on my finger. It should be something completely meaningless to the world, but it means all everything to me because I'm the one who gave myself that determination. So if I can give myself a command and then at 1230, I actually performed that commandment. I have set my will in motion and I have fulfilled the will through action. So in this way, I begin to gain control over the expression of my will. I begin to, to be able to give myself a command and follow through. This trains not only my thinking, but it gives, gives me then the ability to begin to control the, my will itself. 
The third activity is the one that often brings a, a certain feeling of discomfort to human beings. And we need to understand what Rudolf Steiner is saying when he speaks about the control of the expression of feeling. He, did, he says, of course, we have a tremendous a range of feelings. We have joy and sorrow. We have pleasure and pain. We have sympathy and antipathy. He says, of course, the human being experiences these feelings very deeply. In a certain sense, you could say, a, a, but a feeling that becomes, that runs away with us becomes an emotion. And in a certain way, we want to be able to control the expression of our feelings. He says, one would think that controlling the expression of rage would, in fact, or to control the expression of sorrow or to control the expression of joy would dull one to the experience of the feeling. He says it actually has quite the opposite effect. If we control the expression, we give ourselves uh, permission to express joy or to express sorrow or to express rage, but we do so not because the feeling is carrying us away, but rather that we are in control of how much we choose to express the feeling itself. In this way, we begin to gain control of the emotions which are often running through us. Our reactions to the world are rampant. And in a certain sense, we become the victim of our emotions rather than being able to control their expression. So it's not to stifle our feelings. It's not not to have feelings. It's rather to deepen and ripen those feelings, but to begin to gain mastery over how we choose to express them at any given moment. So this is the third activity. And this is, we can practice this again every day watch, engage, how, how if I became angry, did I lose my temper or did I contain it a little bit? And by containing the expression of feeling, I begin to gain a certain mastery over myself and I might be more effective in the situation rather than flying off into a rage. The fourth uh, activity, he says, the fourth exercise is, he says, between feeling and thinking is this experience, if we, between our thinking and our feeling, we will begin to be positive about the world. It's positivity, he says, is in every situation, even in the darkest hour of suffering and of calamity, is to seek truth, beauty, and goodness that is present in every situation. Certainly, if tragedy is happening, if people are suffering, we, we feel very much the suffering. And we don't say that some, we don't in any way gloss over suffering or error where it's present. But rather, we can say, yes, this is a very difficult situation. And, but you know, look at the way people are coming together around this particular calamity. So we seek something of truth, beauty, and goodness in every situation of life. In this way, uh, in this way we gain a positive attitude about life. He says, positivity does not mean we overlook error or, or ugliness or evil we're very conscious of the presence of error and ugliness and evil in the world. But rather, in addition to being conscious of those, we look for truth, beauty, and goodness. The example he gives is a story. He says there's a legend that, uh, that Christ was with his apostles, and they were walking, uh, walking through the roads. And they came, as they turned on the road, they came to the corpse, the rotting corpse of a dead dog. And the apostles, of course, were holding their nose and avoiding it. And as Christ passed the dog, he said, look at the splendid teeth the creature has. And that, in a certain sense, that legend gives us a picture that, yes, of course, there's ugliness and decay and foul smell. But to look at the, look at the splendid teeth that the creature has is to, be, is to have, in that moment of disgust, also to seek something positive. This, in a certain sense, also strengthens the forming of this organ of perception. The fifth exercise is to, he says, between thinking and the will, one, we have to gain the capacity to be, remain open-minded in every situation. Just because something happens, or some, if he says, if we come across a truth that we've never experienced before, if our first response is, I don't believe it, that's impossible, I've never heard that before, of course, we're not going to be able to grow very much if we think that we have all the experiences available to us to which we can judge everything that happens. It's rather to say, then we're, we're not going to make progress, but rather if we can be receptive to new experiences. It was said that uh, Thomas Aquinas was, was a very open-minded individual, and that Thomas Aquinas, this wonderful teacher, 
that his monks around him knew that he was open-minded, open-minded. And one day they knocked on his cell door and they said, Thomas Aquinas, the church steeple is just blown over. So Thomas Aquinas followed them and looked out the window and he said, Hmm, it, it, it appears like it's still there. And they laughed and they laughed. They thought it was so funny. But actually, you could say this was a picture of Thomas Aquinas' ability to be open-minded. He didn't say, no, it's impossible that the church steeple might have blown over. He considered the possibility and opened himself to it. So it's not a question of being foolish, but, but rather of, of remaining open to the possibility that maybe things that have not happened before are happening now. In this way, we open our hearts and open ourselves to new experiences. And this is a very important capacity to have. The sixth exercise is really then to practice, he says, to practice these in various combinations. The objectivity of thinking with positivity or open-mindedness with the control of the expression of feeling. In this way, he says, we begin to harmonize all the various practices. And this creates a balance and a harmony within the six petal lotus. And as a result of that, then the 12 petal lotus comes into a proper balance by forming these six petals. And when the 12 petal lotus is intact, the Ritter Center gives us the picture that when, when these are all brought into proper balance, that something arises in the heart. And in fact, it's the capacity to love. So the capacity to love and the capacity to be creative and the capacity to perceive that another I hope this presentation has been helpful to you and I thank you very much if you have comments and suggestions please add them below and I thank you for participating in this in this presentation